A couple of years ago, one of my closest friends relocated across country with his long-term girlfriend to a job he could not refuse. The only issue is that he didn't want to fly his dogs out with him when they made the move since they'd be staying in a hotel for the first month. He was also a bit hesitant to fly them out due to health concerns for both pets. By the time he located a home to rent, he was missing his furry buddies and made a request of his sister, another close friend, and myself to drive them to LA. Now we are Chicago folks, so the trip would be long, however the three of us could tackle this near 30 hour drive and it would be a piece of cake. We left early and drove long hours. Along the way, it was decided between me and my friend that we would do most of the driving and if we needed to, we'd let our friend's sister do some driving. We were on a bit of a time crunch due to a rental agreement, so we didn't have the luxury to stop very often, past an 8 hour stay at a Denver La Quinta. As for the journey itself, it was relatively smooth, Baron getting pulled over right before entering Utah for driving 2 miles in the left lane of an empty highway. From that point, we made it through Utah, Arizona, and Nevada without much trouble until we entered California in need of some gas. I had been driving for the majority of the first day and tagged my buddy in after being pulled over. I remained in the shotgun seat as the navigator, searching through the GPS for some fuel to stop and get. We kept our eyes peeled for the road signs and found one pointing at a ghost town which had a mobile gas station. It was convenient too as it was located almost directly off the interstate. We rolled in on a little more than fumes when we approached the pumps. Normally, we let the dogs out at every rest stop, but having stopped not long before that, and with both of the dogs sleeping in the back, I decided to pump gas without anyone else leaving the vehicle. My buddy pulled us up on the opposite side of a beat up green sedan with a short plump gentleman who just turned to approach the shop. I noticed a few other people over at the pump, all unoccupied, and there were a couple of cars parked up near the gas station most likely belonging to employees, so nothing seemed out of the ordinary until I swiped my credit card. The pump rejected my first swipe attempt, which I chalked it up to a misread. I swiped it again and the pump reads out, please see attendant. I was annoyed, but we needed gas. I tapped on the window and told my buddy what I was doing and asked if anyone needed anything. After taking orders for Gatorade and Marlboro Reds, I walked up to the store and made a mental note of how strange this gas station was. Kinda quiet, especially for one right off of the interstate. As I walked in though, more weirdness started to happen. The first thing I noticed is that there are some boxes of chips just left on the floor, like someone was stocking the shelves and just quit. As I veered to my right, I noticed that immediately that there was no one in this place. With the six cars, not counting my own out there, I felt like I would see someone. Things got even weirder when I realized that there was no one behind the counter, no customers, no workers, and then it dawned on me. What had happened to the gentleman who was at the pump adjacent to mine? Surely they can't all be in the bathroom. This is where I begin to feel a gnawing sensation in my stomach. Something isn't right. I've always been a person who felt like I could trust my own instincts, and that those instincts were screaming at me to just get out of there. I want to run, but I hold back. I would look suspicious booking it out of a gas station that was empty and decide to play it cool. I tried not to let my body language show how badly I was freaking out in my head. I was probably inside the gas station for only a couple minutes when I left, but I stopped just before exiting to listen for something, anything. A flush toilet would have been a good sound, but nothing. As I exit the shop and see my car, I begin to feel dread. It's like that moment in a movie where the hero is about ready to make it to the end of their trial, but the celebratory fanfare disappears, and in that silence, something comes out and strikes them down. I'm about 25 yards from the car when I see this gentleman come out from around the side of the shop opposite of me. This is not the same man that I saw when I was pumping gas. He was larger, and he had a particular look on his face. The best way I could describe it as it was like Nicolas Cage's smile from Face Off. I continued walking towards my car, but when I turned back to look at him, he was now walking towards me with a purpose. At this point, I noped it all the way back to my car with an increased urgency in my step. And of course, my friend has the car door locked like a complete clown. There is also a 95 pound golden retriever sitting in my seat. Apparently, my travel companions did not notice how freaked out I was or that the creepy gentleman was still walking in my direction. 
I punch the window and told him to unlock the door, to which he only half rolls down the window and tells me that the dog's in my seat and they were afraid she'd jump out if the door opened. I wrenched my hand in and threw the dog towards the back seat as hard as I could while my friend is just now realizing how freaked out I am. I took one last look back and saw that that creepy guy had stopped about a pump away from where we were with that same look still on his face. We found another gas station further down the road, this time with a ton of people inside and out. After thoroughly creeping out my friends with my story, I pumped gas. We made it back to the interstate, which meant passing by that gas station again. It's been about 15 minutes since we pulled out initially, and we go silent as we notice that those very same cars were still sitting in the same spots where they were when we had left. After thoroughly freaking out for a few miles, I received a phone call from my credit card company about a hundred dollar charge at a mobile gas station. The lady on the phone was really helpful in fixing the situation for me It was entirely creeped out by the situation that we were in. In the end, we made it out to LA and had a great vacation, but it still bothers me as to what was going on at that little gas station off the highway. And more importantly, what was the story behind that creepy smiling guy? I was driving at night when I heard an odd grinding noise, like I had run over something that got stuck. It was about 2am, so I pulled into a well-lit rest stop and woke my buddy up. I explained to him as we got out of the car. We heard what sounded like a kid crying. There was no other cars at the rest stop, but we frequently heard stories about kid trafficking and kidnapping. So we decided to check it out. We grabbed our flashlights and headed towards the noise, which was coming from the bathrooms. As we get closer, we realized it was coming from the woman's bathroom. It was a low, dull sobbing. We prepared for the worst and walked in expecting to see a brutally beaten young girl or something, but there was nobody inside. The sound was still there and it was clearly coming from the room, but the room was empty. We turned on all the lights but still found nothing. We checked each stall, the trash can, nothing at all. We even started looking for where in the room it was coming from, nothing. We wondered, is it a hidden speaker, or are we on candid camera? My buddy climbed up on one of the stalls to get to the top window in the rest stop, which was vented out and open. He closed it, and the noise stopped. Completely. He opened it, and there was no more noise. We sat there for a few seconds, staring at each other. He shrugged, then the window slammed shut, again without him even touching it. We were out of that bathroom in seconds. The noise started up about ten seconds later and we tore out of the parking lot. The grinding noise was still there, so this time I pulled over a few miles later at a Flying J truck stop, one that was well lit and occupied. We checked under the car and saw a red and silver piece of metal wedged underneath. We couldn't remove it by hand as it was really wedged in there, so we kicked at the metal to bend it and figured we would remove it when we got back. A week later, I had my mechanic take it out when he was doing a service. It was a part of a kid's tricycle, and the red area was where somebody could stand. It was early November, cold and rainy and about midnight. My fiancé and I like taking spontaneous late night drives. We typically start out on one of the main roads within our city and keep following it until we hit the next town. Sometimes our drive lasts for hours. The layout of my county and the surrounding counties is a little bizarre. All of the cities and towns are isolated by large spreads of wood and country. I live in a relatively large college town, but a half hour drive in one direction can leave you stranded on a jagged unmarked gravel road in the middle of nowhere or in a weird small village that no one knows about. It's actually pretty exciting and that's why we do it so much. So like I said, it was about midnight and we were nearly lost. My fiance is poking around on my phone and trying to figure out what road we're on. We're on a mud path in a pit of a country framed by small towns that we've never heard of. There are no other cars on the road. It's rainy and misty and the headlights on my car aren't doing a thing. There are stands of trees and brush on each side of the road. We're heading north. She tells me that she thinks we're going across 200th Street which runs into Rye Road, which is a straight shot to Winnika. We make our way down the mud road for about a half hour and we never hit it. 
We've always had fun on these sorts of drives, and it's the first time we've ever really been on edge. My fiance says we should have found 200th Street already and asked if we passed it without noticing. I asked nervously if we should turn around, but she doesn't think we can without backing up into a tree or a ditch. I'm driving a Mazda and it was an awfully wide turn. She's biting her nails while scrolling around on Google Maps. Ten minutes pass and we finally see a little black road snaking up a hill, branching off the road we were on. I hurried to turn onto it. It's very narrow and twigs and branches are raking the doors and windows of my car. When we complete the climb up the little road, we find ourselves in a wide paid clearing with a house at the back of it. Tucked into the thick woods, my fiance doesn't miss a beat and starts hissing for me to turn around. Our headlights illuminate the whole property, which is in major despair. No lights, windows are shattered, the siding and the shingles were shredded. The yard is littered with scraps and trash, barrels, car parts, tools, hundreds of glass bottles, branches, slabs of concrete and rocks, and a nasty old Chevy pickup. It looks like there's a house sitting on the top of all of it. Every inch of this property is entangled in nets and ivy and weeds. My fiance points out little moving shadows and glowing spots around the yard. There are dozens of cats around and they look like they're all looking at us and their eyes are glimmering from the headlights. I almost pee my pants when a walnut sized rock darts out of the brush and pops against my windshield. It fractures the glass. My fiance screams and grabs my arm. She's screaming, what was that? What happened? Oh my God, what happened? The rain is pouring in black streams down the trees, over the house and across the pavement, and all of the blood runs from my face. After a few seconds, a man stumbles out from the bushes and weeds, and he's carrying a shovel. He's swallowed in a big dirty navy coat and has a beard. Then the screen door on the house opens and all the cats scatter. A tall, thin, spottery woman crawls out of the porch. She has long, wild gray hair. She's just up enough on the porch that the headlights don't reach her eyes. She wipes her unusually dark hands on her skirt. I have no clue what was on her hands, but that's not what I remember the most about her. It was how dark her hands were, and she stares at us. My fiance once again is screaming and crying and slapping the door lock repeatedly. I throw the car into reverse, rolling over center blocks and branches, and then screech back down the road. After my fiance stops crying, there's some distance between us and the house. I start to relax, yet when we get out of the woods and hit the long straight stretch of road, I notice that there's headlights behind us. I get a stomach ache when I realize that the car was mimicking all our turns onto the different roads. After nearly half an hour of being pursued, we finally reach Flory and pull into a gas station being visited by a few other people. I watch the vehicle pass. It's the same nasty Chevy truck we saw at the house. They stalked us all the way down to the next town. We wait to see if the truck disappeared down the road before we get out to get some food and ask for directions. On our way home, I look at the rearview mirror more than I do the road ahead. When we get back early in the morning, my teeth don't stop chattering until I fall asleep. So near where I live, but a little further out in the sticks, there's a glorified gravel path in the woods called Rube Hill. It runs maybe three miles long, and only a half a mile of it is paved. On the south end is the pavement, with a few old but otherwise normal houses dotting it. After that, the houses end and the pavement ends, and the gravel road shoots up a steep hill. It's not taken care of at all. The gravel is piled up in potholes and berms, so unless you're driving a nice off-road vehicle, you want to take it easy. So since you need to drive slowly, you get a nice clear view of the handmade signs nailed to the trees with messages like, no trespassing and we're watching you, scribbled in sharpie. At the top of the hill, the road winds lazily for a little under a mile before diving back down on the other side of the hill. The gravel is in equally crappy condition on this side. After you reach the bottom of the hill, the road cuts straightish for about a mile through cornfields before intersecting with another road. The reason I am so familiar with this layout is because I've taken some friends on there for late night drives to scare the crap out of them. It's never an elaborate prank. I just drive slow and play creepy music to get them amped up and paranoid. I always make sure to tell them about the meth heads and their labs that are out there, 
and how the sheriffs tried to avoid going out there because it's too dangerous. I figured it was all just made up, just fake stories, but I think now there's an element of truth to some of the rumors. I was with my friend Aaron one night, and we decided to go for a late night drive to Rube Hill to freak ourselves out, so we took off and drove down the various country highways and back roads and turned onto it. I made sure to play extra creepy music since me and Aaron had been here before. It honestly lost its creepy luster on me by then, but I still enjoyed the long drives and scaring my friends. Of course, it mostly went by as uneventful, and we were almost across the hill, about to descend on the other side, when Aaron freaked out. I checked my mirrors to see what he was freaking out about, and saw truck headlights down the road. They seemed to be back where the road first topped the hill. The truck was sitting under the only street light at the top of the hill, a really dim orange one, and I could see it was kicking up a ton of dirt. It was speeding towards us. I paused the music, and sure enough, with the windows down, I could hear the gravel crunching and flying like the vehicle was speeding. Keep in mind that I had driven this road dozens of times, both during the day and at night, and I have never encountered another vehicle. So having a truck speeding seamlessly to catch up with us at midnight on a road lousy and rumored with meth heads was pretty jarring. Usually, I didn't relinquish my brakes when driving down the hill, but this time, I didn't even touch them. So the next day, I'm hanging out with another friend, Chris. Chris and I are just lounging around playing video games and talking about quantum physics, which is one of his favorite things to talk about. I told him about me and Aaron getting chased the night before, and I kinda amped it up. I tried to make it come across as a little scarier than it actually was, but now Chris wanted to go on that road. So we waited until late that night, about 2 in the morning probably, and went to Rube Hill. This time, I wasn't playing any music. I wanted to be alert. It was all going quite normally, just like usual when I slammed on my brakes. I threw the car in park and just said, Uh, you see that too, right? I looked at Chris. He was just as confused as me, and then he nodded. My headlights were clearly illuminating a thick metal cable stretched across the road. On the right, it was wrapped around a tree at what I guess was roughly head height for a standing adult, and it was pulled tight across the road and anchored to a fence post at roughly chest height. I had no idea what to make of it or how to react. Then I heard gravel being thrown by tires. I checked the mirrors and sure enough, truck headlights were tearing down the road from behind us. I started freaking out. My breathing and heart rate were out of control and I began sweating. Chris just swore under his breath quietly. I threw it in drive and pulled as far right as I could and my low sitting car slid under the cable with a loud metal on metal scraping noise. I cringed as I heard the scrape, but I wasn't about to sit there and get deliveranced. So again, so once again, I flew down the hill, and this part is the creepy cherry on the Sunday for me, personally, because Chris didn't see it. As we left the tree line and entered the cornfields, I glanced to my right past Chris and briefly caught a glimpse of someone standing about three or four feet back in the corn. I just felt my stomach scrunch up and I floored the accelerator. I glanced in my rearview mirror and I could see a man standing in the road behind us, illuminated by the moon and my taillights. He had a long object slung over his shoulders. I couldn't tell if it was a cane or maybe a rifle, but I didn't stay to find out. Before I could even tell Chris about it, we were around the bend and out of sight. I haven't been on that road since.